Hey everyone, I'm Deb Goodkin, the Executive Director of the Free BSD Foundation. So welcome to our 17th introductory talk on Free BSD. So we started the series last year to provide a way to connect the community and provide an opportunity to learn about different areas of Free BSD. So let us know if there's any topic that you would like to learn about that we haven't covered already. If you have a question today, please put that question in the IRC channel and proceed it with a queue so we know that it's a question. So today, our presentation is part one, using Git to track FreeBSD by Warner Losh. So let me tell you a little bit about Warner. First, he's a fellow Coloradoan. So for those of you that don't know, the foundation is based in Colorado in the US. So Warner has been involved with the FreeBSD project for a number of years. In his career, he's helped build everything from systems to measure the atomic clocks at NIST, which is actually here in Boulder, to optimizing the servers that deliver you your Netflix shows and a lot in between. Today, Warner will give a talk on interesting ways to use Git to track FreeBSD. So now I'll hand this off to Warner. Thanks, Deb. So can everybody see my presentation? I'll assume that's a yes. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm gonna give a talk about um, tracking FreeBSD with Git now that we've transitioned over to Git. Uh, and this is a big topic. So I'm gonna do this in two parts. Um, today I'll be focusing on um, the point of view of if I'm a user or a system in, or maybe someone who has a, a small distribution, a uh, small number of changes that they need in FreeBSD. Um, you know, how do you use uh, the new Git system uh, effectively? Um, so I'll start by talking about some of the basic concepts of Git. Um, and then I will talk about kind of the mechanics of tracking FreeBSD without changes. And that's pretty easy. And then I'll talk about, um, well, what if I have changes? What if I have local changes I want to keep track of? Um, what are the different ways of doing that? Um, Git's a very powerful and rich tool. It provides a number of different ones. Some are better for uh, certain situations and others are better for different situations. So I'll talk about that. Um, and then if you've got local changes, uh, maybe uh, you have local bug fixes or something you want to contribute to FreeBSD. So I'll um, talk a little bit about the different ways that the project um, reviews and verifies patches from our users uh, and how you can submit patches. Um, but before we get started, uh, I wanted to, um, there's some people have a confusion. You, they hear about GitHub or GitLab and they think, oh, that's what Git is. And actually they're two different things. Um, Git is uh, the underlying program and repository uh, that is used to measure, to manage the source code. And GitHub and GitLab and Codeberg and a dozen other um, companies make a business of hosting these repositories and then adding different um, features to make it more useful. They add continuous integration and workflow um, and different ways to collaborate or track problems um, and accept patches and changes from the community. And, and some even offer ways of um, communicating with the community or having the community community communicate with themselves. Um, I won't be talking much about GitLab or GitHub today, uh, except that's one of the places we mirror to. Um, I'll be focusing primarily on Git. So let's get started um, with some of the Git basics. Um, so what is Git? Well, Git is a version tree of files with annotations. It's kind of a high level way to think about it. Most people use this to implement a source code uh, or source management system. Uh, and what Git does is it um, allows uh, the version of this tree to evolve in different ways and to have multiple independent evolutions. This is useful in the FreeBSD project. We have our main line of code and then we have our stable branches. Um, Git is much more powerful and flexible than that, um, but I won't get into a lot of that power today. Uh, in addition to branches, which uh, track the evolution of a, a, a line of code or a, 
of um, you know, a set of code. Uh, Git has tags that let you point into the tree. Um, and of course, the individual nodes in this graph are commits and they describe um, not only how to go from one version of the tree to the next, but also who made the commit, why the commit was made, some other meta information about that. And another interesting and fairly unique thing about uh, Git is that it's a distributed system. So you have the source of truth repository for FreeBSD, but um, it's only the source of truth because we, we say this is the source of truth. Um, in Git, all uh, repositories are equal in some ways, um, but they can have relationships between each other. And I'll, and I'll get into some of that because it can be a little bit confusing um, before we get started. Um, and by the way, what's a repository? Well, the repository is the container that Git uses to implement the versioned file system or the source code management or whatever you want to say. Um, it is a collection of nodes, like I said, that are organized into a graph. And Git has different ways of marking branches and tags. And that information is also stored in the repository. Um, and finally, uh, a lot of metadata about the repository. Where did this repository come from is stored in the repository. Also, if you're in the middle of a complicated uh, Git operation, that information will be stored in the repository. Uh, so when you clone it, most of this information, but not all of it is copied. And I'll get into some of the uh, more specifics on that. In theory, you can have an arbitrary graph, um, an arbitrary directed graph in Git. Um, this is a graph that I found that is probably really gross and disgusting from a source code management point of view, although it looks kind of pretty and fills the whole screen. Um, FreeBSD's history isn't this tangled. We have nice uh, branches that uh, are fairly linear. We have uh, support branches that are linear uh, as well, so uh, that we don't run into a lot of the problems a tangled branch like this would um, create. I said that Git was made up of um, commits, so let's take a little closer look inside of a commit. Um, this was just whatever uh, tree that I had open when I was writing this talk. Um, we have uh, the hash, and the hash is like the address of the uh, commit. It is computed cryptographically uh, based on the metadata and the changes in the commit. Um, so each one is globally unique. I'm going to put an asterisk by that because crypto uh, notions of globally unique change over time. And so, you know, that might change. Um, the other thing that this list is um, stable MSC 12. And that's uh, just the branch that I was doing. Um, I'll talk about why I use that branch in the second part of my talk that's geared more towards developers and less towards users. Um, but that's another thing that you'll see if you start looking at commits or uh, using git show for a particular commit or git log for a list of commits. Um, each commit has a parent, but Git only shows that when it's a merge commit. And a merge commit um, has multiple parents and draws lines um, or uh, branches of code together into one commit. And I'll talk more about what that means when I talk about different workflows. Um, it also has a, num uh, a fair amount of metadata. Git separates who wrote the commit from who pushed the commit into the repository. And this is useful. Um, this is something that I wrote to fix a problem that people, um, that Ed noticed um, with building uh, the bootloader. Um, but it could just as easily have been a contribution from a user, in which case the author would be that user's name and the commit um, would have my name on it. Uh, there's a commit message that describes what all's going on with the commit. Uh, and then there's the diffs that tell you how to get from commit to commit. Now, this is fairly straightforward for any source code management system, but I thought I'd um, just uh, start there. The next thing we have in Git, I mentioned tags. Tags point to a particular node. It says this node has this label. And tags can be either plain tags that just do the pointing, or they can be annotated tags. And an annotated tag um, points to a particular location, but has text in it of some flavor. This text could describe what it is. It could be a cryptographic signature. 
um, and annotated tags are considered interesting. Um, when I talk about uh, some of the workflows for developers, um, when we push tags up to the main repository, we only put the interesting ones. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why we do that. And, you know, the developers will get this in a couple of weeks when we talk about it. The other tags are considered transient and local to your own repository and can be very useful if you want to tag things. Like um, one of the things I do is I have a tree that I check out. And when I build and install the world, I, I say install dash and I put a date um, so that if I need to go back, you know, I've updated the tree, I do things, I need to go back, I can find exactly what's on that particular system. Branches are basically movable tags. They point to the tip of a series of code. Um, and when you make a new commit to that tip, it moves um, not only the, it adds the node to the tree and automatically moves the pointer to the front of that. And, and, I'll, and I'll show you that graphically here in a minute. Um, branches also can have an uh, origin that they track. This is an upstream origin. So when you pull the FreeBSD repository down and you have the main uh, development branch or one of the stable branches. Um, the way that you can update it locally is because it keeps a copy of where the origin or where it came from. Um, and let me talk about that right now. You have the remote repository or the origin and the local repository. That's what you have on your local machine. Clone copies everything from the remote repository to your local machine. Um, and it renames some of the tags and branches, depending on uh, how you have things set up. Uh, and that renaming allows it to fetch updates and update the tags as they evolve on the remote system. So let's, let's walk through that briefly. Here we have a simple repository. It has four nodes on the main line, but nothing on, on the local machine before we do a clone. So now we do the clone. Um, the dotted lines show the relationship uh, between the remote machine and the local machine for things that are identical. So we've brought in the different changes um, and we've uh, brought in the main branch and we've rewritten that to be remote main. And since we uh, part of clone checks things out by default, we create our own main branch um, as well that points to the same place as the remote. And that seems a little complicated at first, but what happens when um, things change on the remote. Well, when things change on the remote, uh, there are, you know, its notion of where the main is changes, but our local copy doesn't change at all. We have to do things to pull those changes in. Um, one of the ways to do that is with git fetch. And what that does is it, up, it will update all of the um, commits that are on the remote, but not on the local system. Um, and in addition, it will update the pointers for the branches. So remote main has moved here, but our local main hasn't moved yet because we just told it to fetch the changes. We didn't tell it to update anything. Uh, so the way you do it, uh, there's a number of ways to do it. You can do it with a merge or a fast forward merge. Um, a fast forward merge just moves the pointer. Um, um, uh, other merges will create a new commit to bring the changes together. Um, so here we have everything lined up. But what does a local branch look like? One of the things I'll talk about later in the talk is, hey, you could use a local branch to keep, keep track of your changes. And here's three or four different ways to do that. Well, if you don't understand what a, a local branch is and how it changes or doesn't change with as the remote changes, it might be a little hard. So I'm gonna spend a moment with that. If we step back to just after the clone, um, and we create a local branch called foo, and it's got um, a commit on it. Um, here they're numbered sequentially, one, two, three, but the hashes, as you saw from the anatomy of a commit, are actually this crazy long number. And rather than put crazy long numbers here, I put um, you know, things that are easy to understand and read, uh, but really these are still crazy, crazy long numbers, you know, kind of behind the scenes. Uh, so if we do a git pull, that combines the fetch and merge steps um, in the previous example into one step. So it brings the new changes in and also moves the um, branch pointer forward. But it doesn't affect the local branch at all. 
it's still pointing to where it was. Uh, so you have to do things to move it forward. I'm going to move it forward in, in, in this example with the rebase. There's another other ways to do it, but this illustrates the point that um, the branch is local and you have control about when you update and when you do things with that branch. So let's talk about um, the repositories that FreeBSD has. FreeBSD has three main repositories that we publish. Um, we have the base uh, repository, which is also sometimes referred to as the source repository. This has the user land utilities and the kernel that um, we distribute. We have the ports repository, which is the basis for all of our packages uh, and has all the third party things like Chrome and Python and Ruby. Um, and then we have the docs tree, which has our handbooks and our website in it. And uh, for developers, um, we update the tree using SSH. So I've included the SSH URLs here. If you happen to be a developer and want to pull things in. Uh, but if you're just a regular user, um, you can use the HTTPS um, URLs here if you want to pull things in. And I'll um, walk through this uh, when I talk about tracking um, the things. I just wanted to have a slide here that had this information. As well, we have a um, web browser. Uh, this replaces svnweb.freebsd.org, um, which was the old web browser when we used uh, Subversion. Uh, cget.freebsd.org lets you uh, choose your repository, look at different branches, look at different commits, much like SVN Web did um, before we made the switch. <clears throat> In addition to having the source of truth um, uh, from our machines, we publish uh, to a number of mirrors as the FreeBSD project changes. We push to GitHub, and I've listed the URLs here, um, and GitLab and Codeberg monitor our repository and automatically pull things in. So these mirrors will be mostly up to date. They update every five to 15 minutes. Uh, so if you need a change that was just committed, you might have to wait a couple of minutes. Uh, but in general, they're fairly up to date. One of the things uh, to keep things simple uh, is some of the mirrors, we don't push absolutely everything that we have in the FreeBSD repository. To GitHub, we don't push vendor branches, for example, because there's a lot of them and the menu system on GitHub gets overloaded by them. Uh, all this information is available in the handbook uh, in the mirror section, and I've included a link here if you'd like to go and read more about uh, that. Um, and uh, uh, in addition, there's um, adjacent sections that are also interesting to look at. So with the preliminaries out of the way, Let's say I want to get FreeBSD and track, track the source base. Well, as I alluded to earlier, you clone um, the tree and you do this with the Git program. Now, the Git program isn't installed by default on FreeBSD. You have to package add Git or you need to build it from sources. Um, I'm going to assume that if you're tracking sources that you know how to do that. Um, but in hindsight, maybe I should have added a slide that uh, had that for people that are coming along later. Um, so I have the clone command that we recommend in our documentation. Um, and it sets the origin name to FreeBSD. We use that kind of idiomatically in our documentation so that there's a very clear uh, distinction between what's the FreeBSD repository, what's your local repository, and what be, might be other repositories that you're pulling from. Um, I list the URL to pull it from. You can use any of them from the table or the mirrors. Um, and then I tell it to check out into the FreeBSD source directory. And the FreeBSD source directory, um, I do that because source is kind of generic. If you're checking out a bunch of things, cloning a bunch of things from a bunch of different projects into a common directory, it might conflict. So we recommend that people check out to FreeBSD source. Now the default branch in FreeBSD is main, which is our main development branch. Um, if you wanted to clone and check out one of the stable branches, you would just add dash B stable 13 or dash B relinge 12.2 or whichever branch you'd like to check. And I'll get into the different branches that the repository has here a little bit later in the talk. Um, 
And once you've done this, you can build world and update your system. Updating the system is really beyond the scope of this talk, um, but I've included a link here to the handbook uh, for people that uh, need to, uh, or that want to update their system and, and need some instruction on, on doing that. Now, once you've um, cloned once, FreeBSD developers are going to commit changes to the main repository and you'll want to update. And the way to do that is um, by doing a, free, uh, a git pull. Um, I added dash ff only so that the FreeBSD tag and the local tag are ex exactly the same at all times. Um, if you ever have a situation where you have local changes and try to do a pull, um, that will fail because the local changes interfere. Um, and rather than get into how to cope with that, I'll talk about different ways to, to handle local changes a little bit later in this talk. Um, but once you do that, you would do a build world, build kernel, no clean, because if you had the sources before, you probably built, and a no clean build is much faster. So another thing that you need to know when you're tracking FreeBSD, and, and this is in the handbook as well, but um, we have a main development branch. I mean, it's named main. Um, <clears throat> and you might hear it referred to as FreeBSD current or current. The mailing list is FreeBSD current. Um, and that's the, the latest version. And generally when things are committed, they're, they're good and tested, but sometimes they aren't. So it can be a little bit bumpy tracking this. Uh, because of that, uh, we have uh, every couple of years, every two, three years, we branch off a new major release. Um, major releases are called stable releases. And so they're named stable slash a number. Um, the most recent one was 13. We branched that earlier in the year. <clears throat> and stable 11, 12, and 13 are active. Although stable 11 uh, is nearing its end of life. It's um, end of life is the end of September. We also have a policy um, where all changes are committed to main first and then merged to the stable branches and from there to the release branches. Um, <clears throat> not all the changes that are made to the main branch get merged back. Some of them are too risky or too big or just um, you know, part of an ongoing development effort so they aren't ready to be merged into a stable release that always needs to be stable. Um, now there are some exceptions to this when um, the change is only relevant to stable, but um, you know maybe one in a thousand um, commits are a direct commit to a stable branch and the rest, the other 999 are merges from uh, current. Uh, and I'll get into in my second talk, which I'll be doing in a couple of weeks, I'll get into the nuts and bolts of how we uh, manage the merge and, and, and all of that. Um, so in addition to stable releases, um, we have relinge branches. And these are branches that we use to create the release. And we update them very infrequently, maybe about once a month or so, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Um, these branches have security advisories um, that fix security problems merged in. And in addition, uh, they have very important bugs um, that have been merged in. If there's particular hardware that doesn't work at all in a release and needs a quick fix to, to make it work, that's the sort of thing that would show up in an engineering, um, uh, in an engineering change. So if you want to track the stable branch or one of the release branches, it's pretty much the same as uh, tracking the main branch, except when you clone, you like I mentioned earlier, you add dash B, the branch name, or you could just check out that branch name. There's nothing that says you have to stay on current forever. You can go back and forth, although sometimes there are bootstrapping and building issues. Um, and if you check out an older stable branch from uh, the main branch, when you have a tree that has the main branch checked out, um, that can take a while. Um, some developers that have to track multiple branches will use Git work trees. Um, I'll talk about that in the developer talk here in a couple of weeks. In addition, um, the stable 12 and stable 11 branches 
since we converted from subversion to Git in the middle of those branches, we decided to publish all the changes in Git to those branches for the lifetime of the branch. Um, it's on a best effort basis. It's not our primary way to, to publish these. Um, we have automation, it usually works, but when things go wrong, it can take a few days sometimes to correct that. We did this so that uh, people that had a number of scripts, build scripts, deployment scripts, what have you, that relied on Subversion didn't have to retool instantly when we made the cutover to Subversion. This gave them a reasonable timeline to do the conversion. Um, they would need to do it before they changed to stable 13 or sometime before the end of life of stable 12 if they wanted to stay on stable 12. Once the project's official support ends for these branches, no further commits will be mirrored, even if further commits happen. So any commits to stable 11 that happen after the end of next month won't be, uh, won't be mirrored. Um, and we do that just the more things we have mirroring, the more things can go wrong. Um, and we want to retire this as quickly as we can. So the ports tree, ports tree is a little simpler, but conceptually it's the same. You will clone a ports tree um, from the ports repository instead of the source repository. If you have the, um, if you see here, if you notice here that it's uh, slash ports.git as the repository in the URL, um, updating is, uh, Updating is the same. And then once you have the ports tree, you'll need to build the ports with your favorite port building tool. Uh, mine is Poudrier, and I've included a couple links here that uh, describe um, you know, how to use it, how to set it up, um, you know, what, what, it's, what it's used for. Um, there are other building tools that you're welcome to use as well. Uh, the ports tree has some different policies for its uh, branching and um, <clears throat> you know, development methods. The ones that are relevant here is it has a main line just like the source tree does, but it does quarterly branches. And the quarterly branches every three months, first week or so of the quarter, um, a, a new branch is created, the old branch is um, abandoned, and packages start to build out of the new quarterly branches so the old quarterly branch. Um, a quarterly branch um, generally just has security fixes, bug fixes, and a couple of other miscellaneous things that are low risk for the user uh, that are merged in. Um, the ports manager likes to keep the ports infrastructure the same between the quarterly branch um, and the mainline. So any changes to the infrastructure will also be merged. In general, version numbers don't change um, unless it's a security fix. Although, um, you know, there are there can be exceptions uh, for uh, bug fixes that are merged. Sometimes uh, different upstreams will create a new minor or new tiny version for those bug fixes, and then the version number will change. Uh, some important things to note here is if you're tracking the FreeBSD current tree, that will track the main line um, with packages. So if you're building, if you're uh, installing binary packages, those will come from the uh, uh, main branch of the ports. If you have a stable or release system, that will come from the quarterly branch, uh, for, from packages built from the quarterly branch. Now, of course, FreeBSD being very flexible, you can change which one you want. If you have a stable system but want the latest ports, you can pull from the latest and vice versa. This is just what the default is. And talking about tracking ports and packages and all that is a really big topic. Um, so I've included a link uh, to that here in the handbook for people that want to find out more information about that. Um, since this talk is, is trying to stay more focused on the nuts and bolts about tracking FreeBSD with what you need to know and pointers to everything else. FreeBSD project also keeps its documentation and website in the Git repository in the doc repo. Um, doc repo is a great place for people to uh, contribute. Uh, we need translations. We need additional material in the uh, doc, uh, handbook and different articles. Uh, I've included a pointer here to the FreeBSD doc project primer. Uh, that uh, talks about all the nuts and bolts of working with the project, how to deal with ASCII doc, um, how to run Hugo and all of that. 
Um, one of the really cool things is with the conversion to Hugo is we have live updates. Um, when you first start up Hugo, it rebuilds everything. That takes a few minutes. It can be annoying. But once you have Hugo running and you've got the document that you're working on um, up on the web, web browser, as you're changing it in the editor and saving it, it automatically updates in the web browser, which is a, a, a nice new feature. It makes working on the documentation a lot easier. Now, uh, you know, particularly if you have to tweak typos or layouts or I've got a lot of little things you need to do. Um, you don't have to wait minutes in between them to see if you got it right. So all of that up to this point, the first half of this talk has been, you know, what is Git and how do I track FreeBSD unchanged? And there are a lot of people though that um, track FreeBSD and need particular changes um, that uh, aren't in the version that the FreeBSD project publishes. Maybe you need a bug fix from a newer version. Maybe you've got some local tweak you need to make. Maybe there's a performance enhancement you can make that isn't really relevant to the general case, but it's relevant to you. How do you track all these changes? Well, one of Git's main strengths is merging. And here I'm using the term merging in um, a very expansive way to mean all the different ways of moving code uh, from one part of the tree to the other. Uh, Git recognizes two primary types of merges, or two very primary types of doing this. One is a merge that's created with the git merge command and it creates a merge commit. And the merge commit draws together two lines of, co of code. And when I say lines of code, I mean branches of code here. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and rejoins them together um, into one line of code. Um, a lot of companies will use this when they're developing a product to um, land a new feature. Um, a lot of open source projects do that as well. FreeBSD tries to keep a linear history um, because Git log and Git uh, bisect um, do weird things uh, when the history isn't linear enough. And I'll talk about um, what those weird things are uh, in a little bit more detail in the second part of this talk. So, so as not to get distracted here. Uh, the other thing that Git has is cherry picking. Um, and this moves changes from one place of the tree to another. Um, rebase is a form of cherry picking um, that does a lot of other things. Rebase will copy the changes from one place of the tree to the other and will move the branch reference from one place of the tree to the other. And also if you do it interactively, it has a lot of features for moving things around and splitting or merging or um, uh, combining commits. Um, and this leads to three different types of workflows in the Git world, two of which will be relevant to um, tracking FreeBSD changes. The first is a merge workflow where um, you are constantly merging two branches together. Um, this can be useful when there's a small number of changes. Uh, there's a rebase workflow um, when uh, there's more changes and you want some more flexibility. Um, it's a little harder, uh, but, but it works better in the long run. And then there's a squash workflow, which is more relevant for when you're developing a feature and you, you take all the changes that you made and you squash them together and, and land that one thing um, in, a, in the main line. I won't talk any more about that, but it's good to know that you know, those options exist. As I, as I just mentioned, the FreeBSD uh, workflow, we have no merge commits in the FreeBSD repository. Everything is linear. Uh, there's one exception for vendor branches and I'll get into why vendor branch merges are okay and why they're an exception in the developer talk. Um, and as I mentioned before, main bridge the changes first and then we cherry pick things to um, the different other branches. Um, and you can use git log for find thing, to find things that haven't been cherry picked. Now, uh, as a user, you might not need this so much unless you're having, say, problems with a particular driver. And then you can go looking for changes that haven't been merged into whatever branch you're tracking. Um, I'll get uh, into the nuts and bolts about how the project does mer uh, merges from the main branch to stable branch um, in the developer part of the talk. Uh, 
as well for people that are interested. Um, so the merge workflow, like the name suggests, merges two lines of code together um, and it creates a new um, commit to do that. When you're a user that is tracking a branch that doesn't change very often, like the relng branch, um, this can be a very effective and easy way to go. You merge in, you, you create your own branch, um, and then you merge it to the uh, relng branch, and you cherry pick in bug fixes you might need for different drivers or programs, and or um, any local changes you might have. Some people like to keep their kernel config files here. Um, some people like to keep other uh, configuration information in the same repository. And this is a really good workflow for that. Um, it's really easy to do. Uh, it has some drawbacks. Um, moving off of the parent branch uh, can be difficult, um, which is a fancy way of saying upgrades can be a pain, um, particularly when you have a lot of changes, which is why I'm specifically talking about the merge workflow um, with uh, relng branch. Um, with the stable branch, it doesn't work so well. Uh, but before I get into the what's going on with the rebate, you know, stable branch and rebases, you know, I just I've thought I would graphically show what's going on with the merge. Um, we've got you know somebody who's tracking relng thirteen. Um, they've created a branch for their own local system, which uh, they call foo bsd for some reason. Um, and they've got you know three changes relative to the release engineering branch for 13. So it's 13.0 plus a little bit. Um, and then a new security advisory or new EN comes out. Um, and uh, you know what what do you do? How do you update? Well, you do a merge, um, and this creates what's labeled as F4 here. And that takes all the changes from the last common ancestor. So basically changes four and five uh, and merges it into foo BSD. And now you can rebuild and do whatever you need to do um, to update. And you can do this um, multiple times and uh, it works out fairly well. Um, the other workflow is a rebase workflow. And that's where um, you're constantly taking the branch that you have and reapplying it to the new tip of wherever it is you're going to. And that sounds like it's a lot of hard work, but Git actually automates that, so it's fairly easy. Um, and this works out well when you're tracking a branch that has a lot of commits on it. So if you're tracking the stable branch, or you're tracking the main branch, and you want to have your own changes added in, um, rebasing forward is really good. Why? Well, you'll be doing frequent merges from those branches and there'll be a lot of changes and things get mixed up and it becomes harder to um, take those changes and move to a different branch. So the time comes to move from stable 13 to stable 14. Um, it's, it's much harder to do that if you've done merges all the way through the life of stable 13 rather than doing rebases. Um, and that's just because the different changes are intermixed and Git does a pretty good job of um, handling the situation. But in a project with as many commits as FreeBSD, um, there's a much larger chance for conflict and for renaming and moving around. And um, when you mix all of those together with a merge workflow, you can have problems rebasing or, or moving forward to from one major version to another. Um, so like I showed earlier with the single commit, rebasing uh, just simply moves it forward um, when you do the rebase. As you see, F1 becomes F1 prime because it's a new commit. And maybe it's the exact same diff as F1, but since it's a new commit with a new parent, it gets a new hash. Um, and the old commits are still in the tree. Uh, I mentioned that because sometimes you go, oops, I didn't want to rebase forward. What do I do? And there's ways to recover from that using Git reflog. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time today to uh, go into detail on how you would do that. Um, but it's useful to know that you can if you wind up in that situation. Um, Google will help you out. Um, uh, I might do a future talk that you know talks about, OK, so I've screwed up my Git tree. Now what? And it talks about some of the common scenarios. I haven't decided on that for sure yet. 
Um, one of the advantages of um, the rebase workflow is I'm on stable 13 and stable 14 comes out. Oh, I want to move to it. <clears throat> so it just becomes a rebase. And I've had the, the command here that shows how to rebase bar BSD from stable 13 to stable 14. And um, you know it, it does exactly like you'd expect. Um, I've shown here that uh, the F2 commit is dropped. You know, just because that was already in stable 14 and that was something that you brought back into stable 13 maybe to create your bar BSD. Um, and it also to show all the other examples I had showed that it was exactly the same commits all the time. And I wanted to show that um, rebasing is actually a little bit more flexible than that. So moving on from kind of the nuts and bolts about tracking um, FreeBSD head. Uh, so you're using FreeBSD and there's problems. What do you do? Uh, well, you can file a bug. The bug tracking tool that we use today is called Bugzilla. Um, it's a pretty good match for filing bugs, although you can attach patches to that if you want. Um, the ports tree used to do this uh, to do what we would call pull requests now. They had a lot of um, ports maintainers that didn't have a commit bit, but maintained two or three ports and would submit updates via Bugzilla and ports committers would pull them out of Bugzilla and commit them. Um, and there's some tooling around that that made it a little bit easier. Uh, but if it's more than just a bug report, if you're trying to get a change into FreeBSD, one of these changes from one of the branches that you have, whether you did it uh, through merging or through rebasing, um, Fabricator is a better tool for that. Fabricator is a code review tool um, that has alerts for different parts of the tree for different people. So when changes um, are posted, a lot of sometimes people get uh, CC'd. Um, it's the preferred method for source committers and doc committers to do their changes, although a lot of ports committers use it also. Um, and it's best for uh, you've got a bug, you've diagnosed the problem, and you have a change you're proposing. And finally, uh, as an experiment, we've not turned off pull requests on GitHub. So a number of people have submitted pull requests on GitHub. And they get uh, committed to the tree and feedback happens. But since it is experimental, sometimes there can be uh, a longer lag than we might like with an official uh, supported version. And sometimes um, you know, different members of the project each have their own prerogatives and some don't want to participate in experiments. So sometimes uh, pull requests will get redirected to Bugzilla if it's a pull request and the code is really bad and needs uh, extensive rework or um, you need to solve a bunch of other problems too, then that would go more towards Bugzilla. Um, and sometimes it just goes to Fabricator because that's where the people who can review it uh, review changes. Um, submitting um, bugs with Bugzilla is fairly straightforward. I won't belabor it too much. One of the new things with Git though is Git has a feature that lets you format, um, basically put the, branch into ASCII form. Um, it's called git format patch. And so if you've um, got a set of changes and you have them in a branch, um, the command I've listed on the screen will um, give you a file that you can easily submit to Bugzilla um, that has all the meta information about it. It has the individual commits. Um, it also has commit messages and the contributor's name so that um, we can track that and bring it in more easily. Um, so we don't have to fuss around. Uh, fabricator, um, if you wanna submit a Fabricator request, you need to create an account on reviews.freebsd.org. And a lot of people, if you're, if you're gonna make just one, you could probably just upload the patch to the uh, UI, but if you're gonna make a lot of them, you need to install Arcanist. I know I said it's called Fabricator, Fabricator is one of the tools in Arcanist. Um, and Arcanist uh, installs a command called arc that you can use um, the subcommand diff to submit um, changes or to update changes. Um, since I'm a little short on time, I can't, you know, I don't have time to describe this in a lot of um, detail. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanna talk about 
um, when you're contributing is uh, oftentimes people will ask you to make changes. So you need to figure that out. Well, simple changes, change this to that is really easy to do. Um, you can do that with git commit amend. Uh, but sometimes you've got multiple commits and you need to fix things, um, split things up, what have you. If you need to fix something, um, you can create a small commit to fix it um, and then use git rebase with the fix up action um, to merge it back. And if you've got a lot of these, git provides a way to automate this. Um, you can um, say git commit fix up and give the hash that it's going to fix. Um, and that way, when git rebase um, is run with auto fix up, all of that gets merged uh, or combined together uh, as well. I have squash up here as well. Squash is like a fix up, except you get a chance to edit the commit message. Um, sometimes one's better than the other. Um, <clears throat> another thing is when you're creating a new feature, sometimes you'll find incidental bug uh, as you're doing that. Now, maybe your feature depends on this bug getting fixed, but in general, the smaller the number of patches and the smaller each individual patch is, the easier it is for things to remove. So if you have bug fixes that are unrelated, uh, it can often be faster to get the change in if uh, you split that off and do that change separately. Um, <clears throat> finally, I have a little bit of a recipe that I won't uh, have time to go into in detail uh, for when you need to split a change up. Somebody says, hey, you've got three different changes and they're all in the same file. What's the tool to use for that? Well, you get, you might be getting tired of me here saying this, but git rebase minus I will do that. Um, and git add has a interactive mode, actually has two interactive modes. One is an interactive mode that lets you pick which files if all the changes are confined to an individual file, um, but it also has a patch interactive mode that'll let you select bits and pieces. I want this piece, I don't want this piece, or, oh, I want a portion of this pop me into an editor and I'll edit it so that the portion that I want is retained. Um, and that can be a very powerful thing when you have to break up commits um, or, and in a number of other situations. And before I go, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to the Git working group who worked for a couple of years to get FreeBSD onto Git and disbanded this past summer. Their work was basically done and it was time to get new people, new blood, new energy into that. And so later this month, I'm going to announce um, <clears throat> the uh, kind of a workflow working group. Um, there are a number of issues that we need to deal with. We need to deal with uh, continuous integration, um, improving that. Uh, Ed Mast created a basic smoke test that will compile and boot your system, which catches a lot of problems, but we can do some more extensive testing as well. Uh, in addition, um, we need to uh, look at other aspects of how we use things. Is Fabricator the right review tool? Um, you know, there's some interesting developments upstream with it. Now, does it mean we're going to be able to continue to use that? Or are we going to have to do something new? Or, you know, what are we going to do about that? Uh, so that's going on. And there's just a, a number of other things. So I'll be announcing this working group in... August. Um, and then in early September, once everybody's back from vacation, um, once I've had a chance to collect names, uh, we'll have a uh, kind of a core team office hours where we invite some of the people that are interested and we'll get started um, and kick things off. Um, chances are there'll be a number of subgroups that do different things and do different experiments to figure out, you know, what's the best way to do continuous integration? You know, do we need to have FreeBSD runners? Is that something that other people can provide? And answering um, those kind of questions um, it will be kind of the remit of this. And there are a couple of lingering issues from the old group. So with that, um, that's the end of my first, the first part. Um, I will go to answering questions if uh, things haven't frozen on me. There we go. Wow, no questions. <laughs> we'll give folks a little bit more time. Uh, I'm yeah. gonna drop some questions in right now. But um, thank you, Warner, 
for it. So oh yeah, excellent. yeah. Presentation. One of the things that Tubes uh, was saying was that the squash workflow for um, ports uh, is also uh, used. Um, he thinks these workflows are specific to base. I've used them in both base and um, uh, uh, and with ports um, to, to, to varying degrees. So you know there are some differences, and he's right. And you should be a little bit uh, careful when um, you know maybe blindly applying this if you're a ports committer. Um, do we have any other questions from uh, our uh, lively studio audience? Let's see if there's a couple other places people mention questions. And uh, none of them are mentioning questions. So, all right. I guess, um, <clears throat> I guess since nobody's uh, popping up to volunteer questions um that are relevant to the talk uh <laughs> i like that <laughs> they're cute uh, they are cute <laughs> that they are quite cute um and uh uh there might be a purring group if there are enough cats that show up but uh we'll leave the actual organization of this to a future date the question was will there be any purring groups in addition to the working groups so that was the answer. I guess I'll hand it back over to Deb then. Well, uh, yeah, I'd like to say thank you, Warner, for giving this talk, the part one of a two-part series. And I really appreciate you starting out with it being, um, you know, really more introductory for folks who aren't familiar with Git and GitHub, GitLab, you know, what, like, what are the differences? Because that is confusing. I think a lot of the people who are watching right now probably are familiar with that, but uh, this is a recorded talk too. And so what we hope is that people who are interested in starting with FreeBSD, trying it out, that um, they, you know, they may not understand the differences. So that was really helpful. And I, and I do appreciate like the graphical view that you added to at the beginning. I think as a visual learner, um, that was helpful for me. So yeah, it, um, it was such a basic concept that I learned so long ago. I realized I didn't, or you pointed out, you know, I didn't even realize I needed to explain it. And you pointed out, hey, this is confusing. So you know, that was that was good feedback from, from the rehearsal. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I didn't I, bring it up to to take credit for that, but I was just like, but I do really, really appreciate that. And um, that and was also good, just good feedback. Well, and, and, and thank you for uh, your work, all your work, uh, and Ed Mass, uh, who led this uh, transition from SVN to Git, and knows a lot of work over a, a long period of time, as well as Lee Wen, who's, uh, who's also on our team, who did almost all of the port um, transitions. So, um, so really appreciate that, and, and feel fortunate that the, for, the foundation um, not to pat ourselves on the back, but really that because we have the funding that we could put resources towards uh, those types of areas to help the project out. I mean, that's the whole reason why we're here. So, so anyway, um, yeah, I think I was just looking to see if there are any other questions, but it looks like not. So um, yeah, so just thank you again, and maybe you can get out and outside and enjoy this uh, clear air that we're having for a, a few moments. So thank you, everyone. And goodbye. Have a good weekend. Hey, thanks for listening.